Today's message is uh, one that lines right up with what's taken place here at New Life um, from the first part of June to the middle part of July, and that is with our transitions that we've had within uh, kids and youth ministry. Um, One of my major passions is and I hope always will be youth ministry. Today's message is obviously timely with kind of transitioning with new youth leader, but I also think it's timely because we are just a few weeks away from school starting back up again and our students being put on the spot to live their faith in school, in those hallways, on the basketball court, on the wrestling mat, on the baseball diamond, on the volleyball court, on the cheer sideline, all of those things for them to live their faith through that. And um, so I wanted to share today's message so that they know that we as a church are behind them. I'm going to tell you that that's very important, and I'm going to share some things from what Jesus said as to the mandate that essentially Christians and the church has when it comes to youth ministry. For me, I got my start in ministry, in youth ministry. I was saved at 18 years old. Um, in the church that I got saved in, there was no young, uh, there was no young adult ministry, so there's like You know, where can we stick this guy? We'll stick him over there to just kind of help with the youth and those things. So I kind of got to help out there. And there was some things that happened for me where I was like, man, just, you know, being with students, seeing them chase after God, this is a huge, huge thing to be able to see firsthand. God called me into youth ministry through that. I became youth leader at my home church after just a few years of being there, um, after pursuing credentials and those things, beginning that process. Um, and then left my home church after being there seven years to go to Tiffin, Ohio, um, where I was on staff at a church as a youth pastor for four years there. Um, the, the very first month there, we averaged 12 students in youth group on a Sunday night. Whenever we left four years later, we were averaging 42 students and we had a night high of 71 students at youth group on a Sunday night. Most of that was because of a pastor, Pastor Rex King, that supported me and supported youth ministry and made it a point to let the entire church know that the church had a mandate to support youth ministry in that. So I'm so thankful for him and the model that he had to say, hey, I may be the lead pastor, but I still believe in the youth. I may be the lead pastor, but I still believe in kids ministry and those things that happen there. And so uh, today, before I jump into this message, I want to pose three questions to you. Questions concerning um, young people in church. And the first is, how is your view of young people in the church? Can I tell you that in this church, if not for young people, a lot of things would not happen. Okay. Um, Everything from the platform to the media booth to kids church to toddlers to nursery, to helping out in the kitchen, you name it, there's probably kids or youth involved in it here at New Life Assembly. So I'm just telling you is that they are filling in where some adults won't step up to fill in. Thank God for the students. So what is your view of young people in the church? Second question that I want to pose to you is how do you believe that your view matches up with Jesus's view? Of young people. I think it's very important for us to understand, does how I see young people, kids and youth in the church, does it line up with what the Word of God says, specifically for what Jesus said throughout the Gospels? And finally, a third question that is the message title today is, will they stay? That's a critical question in the church today. Will they stay? When they have that final youth service on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night and they have went to their final camp and they've graduated high school and they move on to college or they stay locally, whatever the choices that they make, will they stay in the local church? Experience says not so much. Experience says not so much will they stay. If you were to ask me why aren't young people staying in the church, it is because they don't feel like they have the support of the church. 
that they don't feel like that people really want them around, that they don't feel like that they really matter within church. You say, well, no, it's that they're going off to these colleges and these universities and they're being taught all of these things. That, uh, what do you think they're hearing from their friends in middle school and high school? Okay. What do you think that they're being taught in some of those things? Look, but what do we want to do? We want to look at it to be the fault of everyone else except me. So we're going to blame it on our higher institutions. We're going to blame it on them just wanting to live life. We're going to blame it on those things instead of saying, no, we as a local church have a role to play to make sure that when students graduate from New Life Assembly and they move on, that we know that they're getting plugged in to a Chi Alpha while they're in, on a college campus somewhere. That we know if they sign up for the military that they're going and they're finding other men and women who love Jesus and they're staying connected with them. That maybe they're going to stay local when they've landed a job or they're staying local for school whatever the case is and that they're going to stay in our church. Or can I say it's okay okay if they move on to another church can I say that 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 is perfectly fine because it's not about new life assembly it is about the kingdom of God so that's the big question posed to us as a church today is will they stay some people's view of of young people in the church I've heard a lot through the years of being a 18 year old person in the church um, to being in youth ministry, to being on staff in a church, to being a lead pastor, and then to now being uh, parents of teenagers. I've heard so many different things within the church. S some things like, you know, good to have around, just stay out of the way. Um, uh, you know, hey, you know, could, could you not bring the weird kids to church? We laugh, but I've heard that. I... I've heard that especially, uh, you know, whenever you begin uh, to challenge your students, hey, the outcasts, the weird ones, the ones that nobody wants to talk to, the ones that nobody wants to be around, those are the ones that make a difference and make an impact for Jesus. I'm going to tell you what, I've, whenever I was a youth pastor, the one thing that I always said was, listen. I don't care if that kid will set off a metal detector from 40 feet away because he's got so many piercings. When that kid comes to know Jesus, you better watch out because other people are going to come to know Jesus in his circle too. Uh, you know, hey, you know, uh, you know, it's good to have all these young people around, but don't get too rowdy. Don't get too rowdy with them. Don't let them get too rowdy. Make sure that they settle down. Make sure that they're not doing too much. Too many crazy things. Well, let's look at what Jesus had to say about children in the Bible. In uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 13, it says, People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples, a.k.a. the religious folk, a.k.a. the church folk, a.k.a. the saints, should I go on or do we get the picture? Okay. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them and blessed them. Can I tell you something that our young people stand for something when it comes to God? They are just passionate about serving God and just wanting to be a part of God's purpose for them. With kids, with children, there's this kind of dependence and helplessness that they exhibit and that they put on before God. They understand that there's needs that they have in life that only God can give them. Now, will there be times that maybe they're looking the wrong places? Sure, we do the same thing as adults. But they begin to understand those things. Now, teenager students, don't get mad when you hear me use the word children whenever we read children in the Bible, okay? Um, 
this was a word in this translation was for children of any age. Uh, teenagers not in the Greek, okay? So I hope that that doesn't really mess with you too much. Um, in the first century, uh, you were either a child or an adult. And so, um, you know, you're like, stop treating me like a kid. Oh, so you, you want to be treated like an adult. Fantastic. Can I tell you that there's these things called bills to pay? Can I tell you that there are these things called chores to do? Can I tell you that the, there are these things? And so don't get upset. Don't get mad whenever you hear children. I'm talking about students of all age. And then also, listen, you know, young people, students, I hope you realize that there are people in this room that are jealous of you and your youthfulness, okay? Uh, many of the guys that went paintballing yesterday, we woke up feeling it right here, Okay? You know, some of the teenagers and some of the kids are like, what are you talking about? I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, yeah, we, we would give anything to not feel that pain here. This Now, of course, one of them is walking around with a big old paintball mark right here on the neck. So I'm glad I didn't feel that like one of our teenagers did. But um, hey, it's a cool story with it. So, uh, you know, people, people get so jealous of young people. It is always fun. You know, isn't it crazy how whenever we're young, we want to be old, and whenever we're old, we want to be young? It's like, where's that happy medium there? And so um, I want to share some things today on what I believe are some solid biblical truths and biblical principles for youth ministry. Now, understand this, is that Justin and his team, they're going to be able to come up with some things and strategize some more specific um, uh, goals and specific um, things that they want to focus on for students, but I'm talking about from a church perspective, this is our responsibility for youth ministry. And the first is to enlist. The first part of verse 13 said, people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. Do you notice that it says the word people? It doesn't say parents. It says people. Because in that time, it was understood and it was common that the saying that we have, it takes a village to raise a child, well, that's really what they did. It says people were bringing children to Jesus. It was more than the involvement of parents. Listen, can I just tell you is that um, some of us parents, we need help from other people. We need help from people to step up and to help with some things. There were neighbors involved in this. Listen, I remember whenever I was a kid that I knew that I knew that I knew that if I did something wrong and mom wasn't around, there was a good chance she was going to know it because we had some neighbors. And those neighbors were like, hey, all these kids in this street, in this area, we're all responsible for you. So we're going to tell your mom of those things. And so I understood that happening in the and they all looked out for us. I mean, listen, I had to do dishes at friend's house. Because, you know, went there, picked out for lunch or whatever. Like, where do you think you're going? You need to do dishes before you leave. So there was that responsibility of the neighborhood there. Um, Matthew and Luke, and their same account of this is the same word, people. Okay, so it is up to the people to bring the children to Jesus. We have to stop talking about what's different or what's wrong with teenagers now than when we were younger. I am so glad that some of the things that are around now weren't around when I was a teenager. I'm so thankful for that. Now, on the other side, as a parent, I'm, I'm fearful of that sometimes. I'll be honest. Uh, but... There can't always be this thing of, you know, why is it this with the young people and why is it that with the young people? But we've got to take time to do something positive for them. We have to take time to encourage them. We are called to bring the youth to know and to be blessed by Jesus. Once we get to the end of this portion of text here, it says that the children came to Jesus and they were blessed by Jesus. Jesus. To me, that is incredible. To me, that is incredible to know that, that there's this instant blessing that happens as they come before Jesus. Why is ministry, why is a focus on young people so, so important? Because 
some surveys will say up to 85% of the people sitting in the church today are there because they came to know Jesus before they were an adult. That's why it's so important is because most of the people come to know Jesus before they turn 18. There's a story about D.L. Moody that once he returned from preaching a revival meeting, he reported that there were two and a half conversions. Someone said, what, two adults and one child? He said, no, two children and one adult. The children gave their whole lives, the adult only gave part of it. From D.L. Moody. Someone that no doubt is responsible for a lot of people in their faith today. For our youth ministry, um, fall campaign, youth campaign is one of their largest tools that they have to enlist students, to get students to come on a Sunday night, to be able to get them there, all in the hopes that there's going to be something at the end that those kids are going to get. Look, whenever I was in youth ministry for four years, there was... There was the first 13 weeks of school. This is what our students heard leading up to it and in those 13 weeks. Don't invite any of your friends to church. Simply ask your friend if they want to have a chance to win a free ski trip. And if they say yes, then say, okay, well then come to church with me, be on my team, you'll hear more about it later. It was all about trying to word it. And so how did we see that increase in students year after year after year through a major event called a campaign? Many of you got a little bit of taste of that at the end for the talent show that the students had a couple months ago. Uh, But that's one of the biggest tools that is available uh, for that to happen. Uh, Because once you get the kids here, there's a really good chance that they're going to come to know the power of Jesus. It's just getting them here. You're like, well... That just, doesn't, that just doesn't seem right to just say, hey, do you want to try to win a free something? Do you want to try to win a, win a this, win a that? You ever try to catch a fish on just a hook? Doesn't work too well. You might get lucky occasionally, but usually it doesn't work too well. You got to have some bait on there. And so that's why we have that in place for them. Second key component of youth ministry that I think that this scripture lines out for us is encouragement. The last part of verse 13. As they were bringing the children to them, the disciples rebuked them. The disciples are trying to keep the people from bringing the children to Jesus. That's what's happening here. People are wanting to bring the children. They're wanting to bring the young people to Jesus. And the disciples are saying, whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. They probably thought that Jesus didn't want to be bothered by all of these young people. They probably thought that, you know, why would Jesus want to take any time for these guys? He's trying to do these great miracles and all of these other things that are happening. You know, hey, don't bring those kids around because they're going to get noisy. But then... It made me begin to think that were they paying attention to what's been happening with Jesus? The way that he's been ministering to kids and to children ever since he's been there? Because in Mark chapter 5, he raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. Did they not see that he had compassion enough to go there to raise Jairus' daughter from the dead? He cared about the children. In Mark chapter 7, he delivered a girl who was demon-possessed with a demon that kept her from being able to speak. Again, Jesus took time out for the children, but yet these disciples forgot some of that because they were maybe caught in the moment. I don't know, but they begin to rebuke people for, for bringing them. In Mark 9, 37, even before this, Jesus told the disciples, hey, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. So, The disciples should have seen all this and heard all of this from Jesus. Why all of a sudden are they trying to keep people from bringing the young people to Jesus? I love Jesus' reaction here. In verse 14, it said, when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. That means he was grieved. Like, It doesn't mean he was just upset. It doesn't just mean he was ticked off. It doesn't just mean that, you know, they were going to be corrected. 
it means he was grieved much. His heart was literally breaking because of what he was seeing happening before him. Jesus didn't tolerate the attitude from the disciples. And guess what? He doesn't tolerate it from us today. If he sees us trying to put blocks in front of children, in front of students to keep them from Jesus, it's going to grieve him still. He is going to be grieved by it. The disciples thought that they were protecting Jesus from the young people. In Matthew chapter 18, it says, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I'll tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like little children. Hmm. How many times do we tell kids to grow up? Jesus is saying, no. Until you act like these or become like these children you will never enter the kingdom of God therefore whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven and whoever welcomes a child like this in my name welcomes me so what about the people who don't want to have kids and youth and students around and they just think that they're bothersome and they just think that they're too rowdy and they just think that they're too loud and they just think that they don't have a place? What about those people? Hear what Jesus has to say. But if anyone causes any of these little ones who believe in me to sin, you say, well, how would that happen? Listen, you let a child or a student know enough that you don't really want them around, that you don't really care about them, that you could really care less about them, they're going to pull away from God, they're going to pull away from church, and they're going to sin. So that's, so if you're wondering how could we really make that happen today, that's how. Goes on to say this, if you cause one of them to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Can I say that Jesus takes ministry to children and youth seriously? He takes it so seriously that he says, if you're going to get in their way, it is better for you to end life now. It's a real deal, church. So whenever we ask this question, will they stay? It's a serious matter that Jesus spends a lot of time on in several of the gospels talking about. So, if you're wondering some of the practical ways that you can do this, that you can, um, us, along with the youth leadership team, can encourage students, here's a big one, talk to them. What? Well, they don't seem to want to talk to me, so what? That's a teenager, okay? But most of them aren't going to be rude and just blow you off. Talk to them. Listen, we are having our kids talk to adults all the time. Many of you know that you've said, hey, do you think Will, Ryan, or Georgia would be interested in it? I don't know. Call them, ask them, text them, go find them, ask them. I'm not going to speak for what my kids want to do or, or what they don't want to do. Like, reach out to them, call them, talk to them. You know, we've got Will obviously trying to go through this recruiting process and talking to these coaches and all of these other things in person and talking to trainers and everything else. I sat on a call with him the other day. I said very little. I heard Will talk to this coach the whole entire time about it. Why? Because it's important for our teenagers to talk to adults. And it's also important for adults to talk to teenagers and to kids as well. You know, listen, do you know how long it has taken me to get some of the kids in this church to like me? Okay. If I am nothing, I am persistent. On, listen, I tried to get hug from Journey. For, oh, you don't even know how long. And finally, 4th of July, I was able to hold her for about five minutes. She's like, mm, done. So, but... I embraced that, but I didn't give up on Journey. I haven't given up on some of these other kids, okay? Um, uh, I know that, you know, um, because these kids need to know that we care about them and that we want to be around them, okay? It doesn't matter to me if they never do give me a high five for three years. It doesn't matter. I'm going to keep on trying. So parents, don't. Don't let it bother you whenever they don't. They're just being them, but I want them to know that I care about them. 
we can all do the very same thing. We should all encourage these kids and these youth whenever we see them around. Just encourage them in whatever way that it is. Listen, I got to tell you, some of these kids around here are sharp-dressed kids. Okay? Others look like bums, but that's okay. Uh, but some of these kids are really sharp-dressed. We should tell them, you're looking good today. That's a nice outfit today, okay? Encourage them in whatever way that we possibly can't look. Talk about young people in a positive way to other people. Make them be like, what planet do you live on? Talk about students in a positive way. Talk about children in a positive way. Can I tell you that some of the things that you think are wrong with this generation of young people is not their fault, it's mom and dad's fault. So don't talk about the young people. Talk about the parents, okay? Because it's their fault, okay? But we, if we try hard enough, we can find positive in this next generation, in this current generation. It is so easy to do. But listen, tell other people about our youth ministry. Tell other people about our kids' ministry here. But above all, above anything else, pray for these kids. You're like, well, if only I could re you know, really think of a way to do it. One of the easiest ways that I have found to pray for kids is when I pass a school. To pray for kids when I go through a school zone to pray for kids when I see a billboard about a student athlete or something to pray for kids that's how we can remember it it doesn't have to be part of our prayer list or anything like that but just know that finally when it comes to a church's mandate for young people we need to help to equip them Jesus said in in verse 15 truly I tell you anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God, like a little child, will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. So maybe you're wondering, what's youth ministry? What does all of that involve? Youth ministry is, simply if I could put it in one word, or I mean one sentence, it would be this. Youth ministry is an offering of service by the local church as a whole, and for young people for the purposes of connecting them to God's grace preaching and teaching God's word accepting them as important to the kingdom of God and showing the love of Christ through our actions and our attitudes that's what youth ministry is about it is about a church as a whole partnering in for those youth leaders and those youth sponsors and those students on Sunday nights here at New Life Assembly. So now there becomes a question of investment. Because can I tell you that those things that matter are those things that you invest in. Those things that matter are those things that you invest in. See, for me personally, people have heard me use the statement, God didn't call me to Collinsville to pastor a church. God called me to Collinsville to pastor a community. If I never got involved in the community, I have no investment into what I'm saying there with that. So that is why I have tried to do all that I could to get involved, mainly through my kids' schools, to be able to help with the things of the community and to be able to do those things. Over the years, it, it has afforded me some really good opportunities that are now starting to come to place. After I came in here um, uh, and just said, hey, I want to be able to really get involved. I was talking with our Collinsville Youth Football uh, board president the other day and I said hey by the way I never got a coaching interview scheduled like that said it was part of the process said Bill you've been interviewing the last three years we've seen it the people that sit in the booth with you on a Saturday as you're announcing all of those games they've seen you we've seen you at at other sporting events and school events we know how much you're vested into this community there was no need for a coaching interview for you for me, I was super humbled by that. I was super thankful for that. But that reminded me that God called me to pastor a community, not just pastor a church. Because why? Because we're going to equip and to invest time into this next generation. I'll, 
I will start coaching second grade football for Collinsville youth coming up here in just a couple months. We are about to get underway. I will be investing Monday night, Tuesday night, Thursday night, Saturday afternoon into these young people, into these kids. And can I tell you that as I'm investing into these kids, I'm also investing into their parents as well. So how are you investing in children, in youth? It's for their benefit. It's for their benefit to be able to come to know Jesus, for them to be able to just be very, very, um, uh, just knowing that God has a plan for them. Can I also say that it's for our benefit as a church when we invest in the young people? It is for our benefit. Notice that Jesus said that the adults need to become more childlike rather than the children becoming more like the adults. Jesus said, hey, you need to become more childlike. What does that mean? Approaching Jesus as a child. And I don't know about you, but most of the time, children and teenagers are pretty easygoing when you can find out what it is that they enjoy doing. It may be different. Jesus knows what they need and what they enjoy. I want to share with you kind of something that has stuck into my mind all of these years from something that God laid on my heart back in 2002, 2003. I had only been saved a couple years maybe. I was already helping out with youth ministry a little bit. And God put this on my heart. If students don't find a purpose in the church, they will never find a purpose in my kingdom. If students don't find a purpose in the church, they'll never find a purpose in my kingdom. I wasn't even a youth pastor yet, but God began to lay that on my heart. God began to lay that on my heart. And from there, it was a conversation with my pastor at the time to say, hey, I have a few ways that I think that we can begin to get students involved in some things. And as we began to get them involved and they began to have a purpose and they found that, wow, I really do have something that I can do in church that that now I see that there's a need for me within my church and many of those young people are serving God today. Are they all? No, I wish they were and they're not, but many of them are. Many are in youth ministry, are in worship ministry, are um, serving in a church in some way, maybe while working another job outside the church. Why? Because God put a word in my heart that if these students don't find a purpose in the church, they'll never find a purpose in the kingdom. And I've tried to lead that in youth ministry and even as a senior pastor. I've tried to lead that charge in that. Can I tell you that ministry to children and ministry to youth is expensive? But it's not just about the money that is spent. It's not just about that. That's just a tool for that. It is not just about trying to make sure kids and youth have a good time and that they're entertained and those things. And then we won't be like, you know, it's all about the entertainment. No, it's not. It's not about that. It's not about the money. It's not about the entertainment. It's not about the different styles of music. It's not about any of that stuff. It is about the kingdom of God. It's about the kingdom of God. If you've never been to a youth or kids camp, you don't know what you don't know. If you've never been to a youth convention to see hundreds or thousands of students worshiping Jesus, even though the decibels are a little bit louder, and even though though that the music is a lot faster, And you may not know what they're saying. There's something about seeing students chase after Jesus. There's something awesome about that. And so we will continue at New Life Assembly to make these investments into our kids and our young people. We will continue to do it. We're going to continue to make sure that these things happen. Why? Because... We want to make sure whenever we're asked the question, will they stay, that we can say yes. Yes, they're going to stay. Think about the investments that we have, and I'm not saying saying that there's anything wrong with the investments that we currently have, but many of us in this room, some of us watching online, we own homes. We make an investment. 
into a home. We own the home. We, we rent the home. We have a home. We're, we're making investments into that. Why? Like, well, that's a dumb question. Yeah, but ultimately it's going to rot. There's going to be a storm. It's going to come and take it away. Eventually that is going to crumble. We make investments into vehicles and cars and trucks and other things. And look, we know that eventually they're going to stop running. We know that eventually we've got to look at that question. Wow, that repair is worth is going to cost more than the car is worth. Is it really worth doing that? We invest into clothes, and it's good that we come to church with clothes on. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We invest into clothes, but eventually, we're go- eventually they're probably going to get a little snug. Or they're going to wear out. They're going to get tears in them. They're going to get all these other things in them. They're just going to just be donated off somewhere. Those things are all temporal. Those things are all temporary. But when, when we're investing into children and, and into youth, that's eternity, church. That's forever. That's a forever investment. And so whenever you see fundraisers happening for children and youth, You've got one or two attitudes you can have. Oh, they're doing another fundraiser? Or you can say, ah, here's an opportunity to invest in these young people again. Here's another opportunity to to invest. Oh, man, I heard that Justin made an announcement that he needs some chaperones to help with an event. Here's a way for me to invest some of my time. Whatever the case is going to be, how are we going to invest into these young people? Church, I hope today is a message that sticks with you for a really long time because every time that you walk through these doors, every time that you walk through a grocery store, every time that you go to a sporting event, every time that you go to a park, every time that you go to a family event, I hope you see see children and youth there and when you see them that it triggers you back to this because if you want them to stay in the church we've got to make an investment into them while they're still here